when, when you pray, you don't pray to an inanimate object with no hope of answering you back. You are not praying to a fake made-up God birthed in the doctrines of demons. You are praying to the creator of the universe, talking to a God who will talk back to you. Didn't he talk back to you on your pillow last night? Wasn't he talking to you when you were crying in your car this week? He is a God who talks back. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Good morning, family. Welcome to church. Are you glad to be in God's house today? I don't know about you, but I've been excited all week about getting back in here after our deeper service this past Wednesday. My goodness, did God not move. My name is Pastor Jason. I want to welcome you all to church on this beautiful day. Isn't it beautiful outside? What a beautiful day the Lord has made. And um, if you are a guest here, if, if this is one of your first few times with us, I want to welcome you. I want to say welcome home, welcome to the family, and I want to invite you to a thing we do right after this church service called Find Family. Everybody say Find Family. Find Family is an opportunity for those of you who are newer to our church to find out about next steps in our church, about the history of our church and where we're going. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to get to know you and you to get to know us. We will continue watching your kids. We'll have a little snack, and it'll take about 25 minutes. And when you leave, you will know all you need to know about Renaissance Church going forward. If you want to join us for that, find family. The line for that assembles out in the lobby at the Next Steps table. Uh, the Next Steps table is where it at, it's at for find family. Or if you just have any questions, somebody will be there at the Next Steps table. Before I jump into this word, I'm so excited to preach. I've got some new partners to announce to you all this morning. Is that okay? Who, who are our partners? Our covenant partners are the ones who have said, this church is my home church. This church is where I'm going to invest my life and my family. God has called me here. Uh, how do you become a covenant partner? The answer is, after you come to find family, you take three short video classes that total take about an hour. If you go on to the hub, the hub is at renhub.church, R-E-N-H-U-B.church. I hear somebody out there excited about it. <laughs> hey, we have no age minimum. renhub.church, and you click the Become a Partner link. Those videos will pop up. You can be a partner by the end of the day. We are rushing towards 333 partners. Why? Because we are building the army for what we believe God's going to do here as we move into the fall season. So right now, we're in an army building season. Um, and so 333 partners is where we're going. Our four new partners are right, getting ready to go wild over these names. By the way, of these four names, three of them are students. How about that? What's up? What's up, Vivid Youth? Come on. That's, that's amazing. And so adults, let's not let the students lead us. Let's, let's step up and lead the, lead the students. So our four new partners are Patience Davis, Clay Morrow, Lexi Wiles, and Peyton Wiles. These are our four new covenant partners. If you are curious, that gives us a grand total of 280 covenant partners right now. That means we need 53 more covenant partners to reach our goal. In ju just three weeks ago when we started this, we needed 75. We only need 53 now. You guys are doing so great. When we reach our goal by the end of June, not if, but when we reach our goal by the end of June, all of our partners are going for a steak dinner. Downtown High Point is going to be catered. It's going to be good. Are you all ready for the Word of God this morning? So uh, this is uh, in many ways a continuation of our uh, talk we began last week on the habit of prayer. Uh, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 12. If you're reading from the Renaissance Bible, which is what I preach out of on Sunday mornings here, uh, you can uh, turn in your Bibles to page uh, 664 in the Renaissance Bible. I, uh, I want to begin with a question, though. Um, what would you do if I got arrested? Oh. <laughs> My bail probably ain't going to be cheap. <laughs> uh, 
to help us, to aid us in this discussion, our um, graphics team prepared a little slide to help aid in this discussion of what you would do if I were arrested. So, so you guys can go ahead and show that if you want to. Put that slide up. <laughs> this, yeah, I'm not too happy about this. I'm not too happy about this. <laughs> this, this is brought to us by the same group of people who put all those stupid posters up around this building with my face on it. Same group of people. So what would you do if, like, the law changed and I got arrested for preaching the gospel? What, how would this church react to the war coming to our front door? What would you do? I, I have, it, we, we're talking about habits in this Atomic Jesus message series. And I have found, thank you for taking that down. I have found, I have found that when all hell breaks loose, we revert to our dearest habits. So some people, when hell's breaking loose in your life, you scream. That's your habit. Some people, when hell is breaking loose in your life, you retreat. And you don't talk to anybody, and that's your habit. Well, what is this church? What would this church's habit be that it reverts to if I, your pastor, got arrested? What would you do? What would you do? The title of my message today is called <clears throat> The Church Habit. Because churches have habits too, you know. They, they do. What would we go back to? What would be our reflex? Churches have habits. You have habits here. Probably, probably you're sitting at or around the very seat you sat in last Sunday if you were here. You're so predictable, by the way. So predictable. You, you, maybe you have a habit of you get here with your kids and you're going to check your kids in first and then go get some coffee so you can have a little bit of freedom from those little suckers, a little bit of caffeine, caffeinated time, caffeinated joy, and then you're going to come in here and get your worship on. Maybe that's your habit. You do things in that order. But, but what would the habit of the church be if all hell broke loose here? What would you do? Some people have a habit of gossiping when trouble breaks loose in a church. You know who you are. Actually, you probably don't. That's the problem. I'm just, just a prayer request, <laughs> you know. Some people have a habit of gossiping. What would you do? Would, if, I, if I got arrested here, would you apply for my job? I'm watching you. <laughs> would, would you post online about it? Would you leave the church? Some people have a habit of leaving when the going gets tough. And we say we've been church hurt over and over again. The truth is you, you're not really church hurt. You just get going when the going gets tough because trouble will inevitably come. The war will inevitably come to any group of people gathering. And so we've got to have a better habit than leaving or we'll never attach. So, so what would you do if your pastor got arrested? This is the very question the disciples in the early church are trying, are grappling with as their pastor just got arrested. I want to invite you all to stand. We're going to read Acts chapter 12 together. Acts chapter 12 says in verse 1, About that time, King Herod Agrippa, this is the government, began to persecute believers in the church. And so the government decides to go Christian hunting. And the Bible says the king has the apostle James killed with a sword. When the government sees that this pleases the Jewish people, he also arrests their senior pastor, Peter. In case you haven't noticed, the church is at war with hell. When Jesus announces the birth of the church, G Jesus takes, I think, great care not to announce the birth of the church at a comfortable place. He could have announced the birth of the church at like the country club, uh, the, the temple, the nice temple they'd have built. That would make sense. It's the center of religion. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus makes his disciples walk 20 miles to the most God-awful place Jesus can find, a place literally known as the gates of hell. 
Why do they call it that? Because at this place Jesus takes them, there's this giant hole in the ground. It looks bottomless. And the people who live in that community, they worship this satanic god called Pan. It's a goat god. And they do satanic things in their rituals with goats. I'll leave that up to your own imagination. But but, but Jesus takes his disciples to this place to announce the birth of the church. And this is what he said. We'll put this on the screen for you. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, some people think Jesus is talking about Peter when he says, on this rock, I will build my church. But he's not. Not. If you read the context in the original language, Jesus has just called Peter the little rock. He said, they're gonna, he said I changed your name to Peter. I changed your name to the little rock. He, but then he says, if you read the Greek, he says, but on the big rock, I'm going to build my church. In other words, the church is not built on the back of any man. The church is built on the blood of Jesus Christ, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And, and so he says, I will build my church or my ecclesia. Everybody say ecclesia. Now, I want you to listen to the language of warfare. Think about the setting where Jesus is saying this. And listen to what he says. Listen to the language of warfare. And he says, and the city gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Will not what prevail? Will not win the war? Will not prevail against my ecclesia? Make no mistake about it. From the inception of the church, its very birth announcement is dripping with, with language of warfare. When you sit down, I've got three message points for you. Here's the first one. You can write this down. Okay, when you sit down, it goes like this. It goes like this. The church and hell. Don't sit down yet. I ain't told you to sit down yet. The, just, just, the, the, the church and hell are locked into a no-holds-barred fight for the future of this universe. The church and hell are locked into a no-holds-barred fight for the future of the universe. And so what are you going to do when the war comes here? Renaissance Church, I'm going to talk to you today about the church habit. Just so that I know if that you're with me, everybody say one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I declare, I declare. a church war. Church. Why don't you all sit down and we're going to talk about how to deal with the issues that come to the church. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my ecclesia. Now, what in the world does ecclesia mean? Ecclesia, ecclesia uh, literally means gathering of people. That's what it means. On this rock, I will build my gathering of Christians. I will build my gathering of people. And, and this made sense in the early church because they didn't have buildings. They had to just gather where they could gather. Uh, so they would gather. The ecclesia in, in the early church would gather in uh, basically backyards and in houses and in public places because they were a gathering of people. And as a gathering of people, they, they exploded as a gathering of people. But, but as time passed... The church became less illegal. In fact, the, the government joined up with the church. And, and the church became wealthy. And the church didn't need to be in your backyard anymore. The church can afford its own building now. Right? I mean, thank God for this building that we're in. Right? And, and so the church started owning real estate. And in places like Germany, in the early history of the church, they would call these buildings where the ecclesia would gather... Kirkus. Everybody say Kirka. And, and so there's the idea of the ecclesia, and there's the idea of the Kirka. And so when the printing press was invented, where was it invented again? Oh, yeah, Germany. And they began to mass produce the Bible. When the Germans translated the original language into German, they didn't use the word ecclesia. They used the word kirka, which meant the building. And we translated that word into our English word, church. But when Jesus said, I'm building my ecclesia, I'm building something, Jesus wasn't talking about a building, he was talking about a gathering. 
And what we have done is we have made our assembly all about the building, about the kirka. But let me tell you something. This building isn't holy. Oh, I just offended somebody. This building isn't holy until you step foot in it. Until the ecclesia gets in the karka, the karka is just another building. And, and so we, we've got to understand that church is not confined to these walls. Church goes out with you when you walk out of here. Because this building isn't the ecclesia, you are the ecclesia. So that's your history lesson for today. What in the world does that have to do with prayer? I just told you the ecclesia is at war. The church is at war. What does that mean? What I mean is the devil's less concerned about our buildings and he's more concerned about our gatherings. Oh, the attack comes against the gathering. And so to attack the gathering, the devil has the early church's senior pastor, Peter, arrested. To attack this gathering, I was thinking about this, it was about 10 years ago that one of our founding pastors, his name was Marty Griffin, was, was taken from us, taken out of this world in the prime of his life, in the prime of his ministry. And that, that hurt this gathering. At the end of last year, one of my dear friends and the matriarch of our church, Pastor Paula Boss, was taken from us because of an attack on this gathering. And it made me so mad. Because we're at war to, to attack the gathering. The enemy, hell, will attack the leaders of the ecclesia. Do you know that the suicide rate among pastors is the highest of any profession? Because we're at war. The moral fail rate of pastors is ridiculous because we're at war. But it's not just the leaders who are attacked. The body gets attacked too. You know that. You decide, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be, I'm going to gather today. I'm going to ecclesia today. And well, doggone it, if your car doesn't break down. Or if your kid isn't sick and you can't gather. To attack the gathering, to attack the ecclesia, the hell will cause stupid, petty divisions to rise up in a church. Y'all wouldn't believe the dumb stuff I've had to referee here. Dumb stuff. And I'm like, can you guys not see what the enemy's trying to do here? Well, she sat in my seat I always sit in. Come on now. <laughs> Choose another seat. We are at war. So let's come back to our original question. What are we going to do when the war comes to this church? Actually, let me rephrase that because if you haven't missed it, the war is already here. We're already knee-deep in war. So now that the war is here, how should this church respond? What should we do? So the story goes on, and it says in verse 5, but while their senior pastor Peter was in prison, watch this, the church, oh, I've got three people listening. The church what? Prayed. The church prayed very earnestly for him. The church prayed prayed. The church has an issue, but the church doesn't complain about its issue. The church doesn't send emails to the leadership about the issue. The church doesn't, doesn't decide to uh, sign a petition about the issue. They don't leave the church and go to a different church because of the issue. They don't emblazon their issue onto divisive political t-shirts and red baseball caps. Oh, I'm preaching so good right now. No, no. They pray together. We talked about this last week. This is called corporate prayer. When churches come together and pray together. God, please set our pastor free from prison. I've never seen this church come together like we did last year when they turned down our building petition. Oh my goodness how we came together. I was so proud of you. But this is the thing. This is the thing. We think the heat's off because we're building a building. 
It's not. We're still as much as war now as we've always been. So we can't back off of our prayer strategy. The early church understood something. The early church understood that the weapons of our warfare are not Facebook posts. The weapons of our warfare are not of this world. When, when we fight with the weapons of this world, we are fighting with rocks and sticks. But the second you bend your knee and bow your head, you open up the nuclear arsenal of heaven. And hell goes to DEFCOM 1. Oh my God, oh my God, somebody's praying up there. Renaissance Church is praying. The early church got that. The early church understood that we don't battle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not people. Our enemy is the enemy. Our enemy is hell. You don't punch at people. You pray for people. That's what we're called to do. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. Not a house of good preaching. Not a house of incredible worship, not a house of how well are you going to entertain my children this week, but a house of prayer. You know, that verse where that comes out of, it happens when Jesus is flipping tables, you know, and, and we get that, we think Jesus was flipping tables because they were selling coffee in the coffee shop. Has somebody come to me at one of those hearings this summer and said, your church is a den of thieves. I said, Why? I mean, y'all won't believe the stuff we put up with. They said, because you sell coffee in the coffee shop. I said, you don't need to go read your Bible because that's not what that's talking about. If you're going to quote scripture at me, at least get it right. So what's it talking about? Yeah, they were, they were selling sheep and lambs and, and birds so that the non-farmers, when they would go to sacrifice, would have something to sacrifice. They were making it possible so that everybody could worship. That's a good thing. Caffeinating you on Sunday morning is a good thing. Some of you need it now. (laughs) What Jesus was mad about is that they were overcharging in their services. And, And so what that meant was that this created in the gathering a class, a wealthy class of haves and a less wealthy class of have nots. And so the rich people could worship, but the poor people couldn't even worship. And this is why Jesus calls them a den of thieves, because they are dividing the body. Jesus isn't upset about coffee. Jesus is upset about division in the body. And that's why he flips tables. Now, that makes much more sense, doesn't it? And so then Jesus says this crazy thing. Jesus says, Jesus Jesus says, my house will be a house of prayer. What's he talking about? Why is he mad at division? But talking about prayer, it's because, write this down, this is your second message point. This is so good. Nothing, everybody say nothing. Nothing Nothing will unite a church like corporate prayer. Nothing will unite a church like corporate prayer. Let me speak speak Gen Z and say this to you like this. If I can pray with you, I can vibe with you. you. If we can pray together, we can vibe together. Because when we hear the voice of God together, as a, ma- as a matter of fact, if there's somebody who comes to me with an issue with the conflict, the first thing I do is we pray together. Because if I can get them praying together, then, then peace becomes so much more easy. And if there's someone in your life right now that you're divided from, maybe they've done something or you've done something, I challenge you, pray for them. Right now, take five seconds right now pray and mean it. God, I pray for that person. Help them. Let them have a good day. And you, you feel the shift? In your, because when we pray together, we can vibe together. Nothing unites a church like corporate prayer. This is why I require our leaders of this church to get together on Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, we get together for at least an hour, and we pray together every Wednesday so that we can all hear from God together. It's that important, praying together. So what this tells me is we need to be better about praying together. So let me just share with you our prayer strategy at our church here. All right? The first thing is that every Monday night right here, there's corporate prayer happening right here every Monday night. Um, Come to that sometimes. 
every Wednesday night, right here at 6 o'clock. I've been asked, are we going to continue this now that our, our uh, small group seasons are sort of fading out? And yes, we are. Every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we're right here praying. Every Friday morning at 6 o'clock. Oh, I'm looking for some brave people right now. We are right here praying. And then at 3.33, everybody say 3.33. How many of you, like me, got, got the life scared out of you in the middle of the afternoon this week when that alarm clock went off? At 3.33, we pray for 33 seconds every day for our church. If you've not done that yet, set your alarm clock every day for 3.33 p.m. We're praying for 33 seconds, 333 partners, and uh, 3.33 we pray every day. I want to read something to you. The Azusa Revival, which many of you have heard of, began in 1906 in a little storefront church on Azusa Street in California. This revival, some have said, is the most significant American revival to have ever occurred as hundreds of thousands of people descended on this little church to see what God was doing. In an age where uh, society was separated racially, this church brought the races together because of revival. For 10 years prior to the revival, African Americans and white people would get together and they would pray together for revival because corporate prayer unites us. Finally, in 1906, the revival breaks out. I'm going to read to you a quote from one of the participants in the revival, and this appeared in the Los Angeles Times. It says, the meeting started by us getting our heads under a bench in prayer. So they're saying they started their church services off with corporate prayer. I see a pattern here. And there under the bench in prayer, we met men only in the spirit, knowing them after the flesh no more. What he's saying here is that corporate prayer united them in the spirit. Suddenly the spirit would fall on the congregation. Men would fall all over the house, like slain in battle. We've seen that here at our church. Uh, it says um, that they would, we would rush the altar in mass to seek God. We never saw an altar call in those early days because we didn't need one. And the preacher knew when to quit. I don't know why he had to put that in there. but <laughs> <clears throat> The Shekinah glory rested there. During revival meetings, the fire department was contacted after several people in the neighborhood saw the roof of the church on fire. But we explained that the church was not, listen to this, not physically on fire, but it was a supernatural fire. And the Holy Spirit was allowing people in the neighborhood to see it. And it all started with corporate prayer. They prayed together and revival broke out. The New Testament church prayed together constantly. Acts chapter 2, they were together for 10 days praying. We can't get together for 10 minutes and pray. Peter's story concludes this morning when it says in verse 6, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side. He's like, hey, Peter, wake up. I'm here. Struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. Watch this. And the chains fell off. Think about the chains that are in your life and in the lives of your family. And the chains fell off. Think about the chains at your workplace. And the chains fell off. This is what they have been praying for, for the chains to fall off. Now, I, I think we've got to, real quick, I just need to draw this distinction. I don't think that the people at Azusa were praying for the fire to light their building. I don't think that the people in Acts chapter 12 were praying for the angel to show up. I, I believe they were praying for chains to fall off. See, this is a problem in churches like ours where we've seen such a terrific outpouring of God's Spirit is that we can put our focus on the fire and our focus on the angels and remove our focus from the chains that we're supposed to be focusing on as the army of God. And so in churches like ours, what you often see is we begin to worship fire and we begin to worship angels and they become our goal. But this is your last message point. Write this down. At this church... We start fires so that chains can fall off. We start fires so that 
addictions can be broken, so that marriages can be healed, so that your grandchild will be saved. We start fires so that chains will fall off. The fire is not the end. The fire is the means to the end. So let's be careful in how we direct our prayer. My God, for a church that would have a heart for chains instead of fire. Oh, oh, we like the show, but give us a heart for chains. Give, give this church a heart for this community, for the triad, the second hungriest region in the nation because they're chains. A heart for the triad where right now 800,000 people are not in church because of chains. A heart for the triad where two years ago in Carver High School, our babies were shot at by another one of our babies because of chains and war in the triad. I suspect because the church isn't praying like it should be praying. We don't start fires for the sake of the fire. We start fires so that chains can fall off. I want to read this to you. So I was researching this week. I went back in my prayer journal. If you don't have a prayer journal, you need one. And this is a younger pastor, Jason, who wrote this right when we started this church. And he was idealistic and starry-eyed at what the church could be. So I just want you to listen to me from 15 years ago. This is what I said. There was once a church who started with the fire of a thousand suns. She broke the back of darkness. She breached the gap between life and death. She filled the void of poverty, and Satan trembled. Demons fled. Sickness vanished in her shadow. People joined her by the thousands. Christ at the reins. The church was something to behold. But then she faded. People got in her way and not people from the outside. People on the inside. People with their own agendas, their own hang-ups, their own prejudice. Took the, the reins away from the only one with the capability of driving. And she the church faded. She started off as an enemy of the state, but she thrived anyway. She was persecuted, but she thrived anyway. The state martyred her leaders, but she thrived anyway. The state made her illegal, but she thrived anyway. In fact, she thrived so much that she became rich, and the money went to her head. The state stopped caring and joined her. Governments were formed in her name. Wars were ignited for her honor. Land was acquired so that she could expand. She became richer. She became greedy. And then with the government behind her, the strangest thing happened. She became lazy. She became out of touch. She stopped speaking into our lives where we are. And she, the church, faded. I don't know about you, but I want her back. I want the original church back, the OC back. I want the OC. I want the hell-raising, martyr-making, yeah, I just said martyr-making, people-changing OC to repent, jump down from her cracked pedestal, start praying again, and join us where we are. I want the church that Jesus promised the gates of hell wouldn't be able to touch. I'm sick and tired of this watered-down parody of what was promised. I'm not interested in choking on yesterday's victories. I want this generation's victories. I want the church. There was once a church. No, there still is a church if she would just listen.